सहनावतु सहनाओ भुनक्तु सहवेरियं करवावहरि तेजस्विनावधीतमस्तुमा विद्विशावहरि ओम शांति 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 In the morning, we said that we are born unintelligent. We are born with wrong perception about ourselves, about the world, about God, and we do not know that they are wrong perceptions. We take them to be right, and our life. is based on these perceptions as i said at any time whatever i do is always determined by what perception i have right now if i have the perception of myself as a speaker as a teacher then i conduct myself accordingly if puja swami ji comes here and i am sitting there as one of the audiences my perception changes then i act in a different way Just sometimes you act as father, sometimes as son, sometimes as mother, sometimes as daughter. Whatever your perception is at a given point in time determines how you are going to respond, how you are going to act. <clears throat> so these are okay, but even subtler than that, that is all right. That's the perception that keeps changing depending upon the roles that we are required to play and the different conditions. Just an example. how different conditions require that we should play different roles and how accordingly we do there also a perception does not change and is a problem normally this man is he is talking to his sister at that time his brother then his wife comes and he becomes husband his son comes and he becomes father his father comes and he becomes son he keeps shifting quickly and usually there is no confusion with his sister he acts as his brother with his wife as his spouse with father as a son no problem if that confusion happens then even in our other life day to day life also there can be problem like as swami ji would describe this man is living for work and he has some argument with his wife and he is angry he is upset and he leaves home he bangs door so it's His husband who is leaving. When he starts his car, then also you know that his husband. Meaning that that anger which he had towards his wife, or the sense of hurt which he has because of whatever his wife said to him, and therefore the role of husband is not yet been dropped. Otherwise, he is no more husband when he comes out of the house in driving the car. He is just a driver. He is a simple person. Then there should no reason why he should be angry. Anger was when he was husband. when he comes out he is no more husband so the anger which was there also should drop off that does not drop off meaning that the husband is not yet gone away and so when he bangs the door it is not the simple person banging the door his husband banging the door when he starts the car is not the person is the husband starting the car when he is driving also he is screaming and shouting at every other fellow you know because they are cutting him no 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 so it's again not the person he is still that angry person the husband still he has gone he has reached his workplace he is still not free from that anger and so his secretary knows and he 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 sneaks out away you know because knows and so how there also in our regular life also if the change is not totally there then there can be confusion there also in which case also there can so if my perception does not totally change then as i said my behavior is determined by my perception therefore this person's perception is he's husband angry husband and there were angry husband that is banging the door driving the car enters the work so secretary says good morning yes whatever he says you know and so maybe when his boss comes or whatever then perhaps all that may drop out hopefully <laughs> <clears throat> 
So we are talking about your more fundamental perception of myself. My perception of my being an individual self. My being an individual being, different from everybody else, possessing distinct qualities, distinct attributes, that I am so and so, I am Swami so and so. And that this is my role, this is this is my requirement, these are my needs, and this is what I am. Thus, everybody has basically a perception that he or she is a limited individual. We have the perception that, or I have perception that, I am a limited individual. Inadequate or incomplete or limited, this is the perception with which we are born. In fact, whatever is born is limited. And therefore, not only human being is limited, every being is limited. But only human being is, has self-consciousness and therefore he is conscious of the fact that I am a limited being. Dogs and cats also are limited, but then maybe more limited than human being. But then they don't have that self-consciousness. Therefore, they are not aware of this, that they are limited. They are limited, but then that not awareness is not there. That I am so and so, this kind of awareness, this other creatures do not have. Someday someone started quarreling with me. So how do you know? You know? Sometimes I give examples. <laughs> Something is only given as an example, you know. But in one talk, this fellow must be so because I, I said, you know, dog doesn't have this. So he got so excited in the question. How do you say that? And why do you think we are better than dogs and things like that, you know? A totally distraction of the discussion. That's not, that's just an example. Suppose dog is self-conscious, doesn't change the fact that we are what we are, you know. This is just to give, a, give as a comparison. It doesn't look like dogs and cats and cows and buffaloes have self-consciousness from their behavior because they seem to be quite contented with what they are. They don't seem to entertain and suffer from any kind of complexes that I'm superior, I'm inferior. There are no complexes that animals or any other creatures have. They are superior. We, we think that a certain dog is superior, some other dog is inferior, this certain breed, and he costs thousand dollars, this fellow costs, I don't know what the cost of dogs is, but anyway, somebody costs five hundred dollars, whatever. The dog doesn't feel that. The thousand dollar dog doesn't feel that he is superior to this five hundred dollar dog. It is the owner who feels that way, but this kind of awareness they don't have. As Swamiji gives an example in a dog show, when a dog wins the show out of thousands of them, when it's taken around, you know, and then, you know, this poor dog doesn't know what is going on, he just looks around. You know. The person who is proud is the owner of the dog. He is very proud. But he is the conscious that I am, I won. That winning, losing is not than the dog, part of the dog. He doesn't think that he has won the show. He doesn't feel any better than what he felt before. And maybe he's made to stand somewhere there and then he's given some kind of whatever they do to a dog, I think, when they award and give him, you know, recognize him. The dog is, doesn't know. He just wonder worrying about when his next bread or whatever is going to come from. It doesn't matter. When we per perform the puja, you know, cow, the go puja, so uh, all the materials of worship are brought and then we, some big good mala is there. This cow doesn't want that mala actually. Cow doesn't want that puja. In fact, worshipping cow or doing puja is a very difficult task because <laughs> cow just doesn't want it. And cow gets scared or whatever it is, seeing a swami or whatever it is, all it wants to do is to eat, you know. Doesn't want to be. So cow has no value for being worshipped. You do that to me, then you know, you find a different swami. Mommy to start, and the whole pose, everything changes because I'm being worshipped. And stupid cow has no sense, I mean there's no appreciation at all. So from this kind of behaviors we feel that they don't have self-consciousness. From this behavior we feel that they don't have any kind of a complexes, that I'm being honored. The cow doesn't, the dog doesn't feel I'm honored. The cow doesn't feel I'm honored. And cow doesn't feel I'm, I'm insulted or something like that. I don't think that cow feels insulted. Or that buffalo feels insulted. There's a cow at home and buffalo also. And whenever the day comes, you worship the cow. You don't worship buffalo, you know. Even the buffalo is giving four times the milk, and still nobody <laughs> worships buffalo, you know. I don't think buffalo feels that it's an insult or something. Otherwise, next time you won't get enough milk, you know. But it doesn't. That doesn't happen. It doesn't withhold milk or anything. That, what I'm saying is that it looks that they're blissfully ignorant. 
of their sense of limitation and therefore they don't suffer from this kind of complexes and so there's no suffering in their life. There may be usual suffering of you know heat and cold and hunger and thirst and stuff like that but no emotional suffering that's all. Human being suffering is emotional suffering. Physical suffering uh, is a different thing which also we do not want but then the samsara is not so much physical suffering because physical suffering is a result of our prarabdha, our destiny. Which is emotional suffering, which is our own making, or is, is, is a product of our ignorance or any unintelligence. So whenever I suffer emotionally, that means that some unintelligence is involved. But anyway, that is how human being is a self-conscious being. And therefore, he is conscious of himself or herself. And the, I always have this complex about myself that I am inadequate, I am incomplete, I am limited, I am inadequate. The, in every self-consciousness, the idea of inadequacy is always involved. That I am an individual being, different from everybody else, I am one among countless. And secondly also, because I feel I am inadequate, I feel that then there is also constantly a need of becoming adequate. So on one hand, I find myself inadequate, on the other hand, I cannot accept my inadequacy. If I go to accept it, no problem. But I find myself inadequate, incomplete, limited, and I cannot accept my sense of limitation or inadequacy. Therefore, a constant conflict is going on in the human mind. Then I, I look around and see whether other people are also like me or not, you know. Some people go to movies for only for that reason. So, some fellows go to comedies, so Swami, there is enough tragedy at home, why should I take, go to a movie <laughs> where there is tragedy? Other person prefers tragedy because then he feels that he is in company, you know, he is company. And therefore, <laughs> there are other people also are like them, so that he feels, I guess, some kind of a like group therapy kind of a <laughs> I don't know what. But anyway, so I look around and see, and then when I find somebody who I think is better than me, then I suffer from inferiority complex. And I find that somebody is not as good as me. I suffer from the complex of superiority. Suffering from complexes? <clears throat> so this is, all this is a result of unintelligentness, if there is such a word, you know. So unintelligentness. This is a result of my not knowing truly who I am. And Vedanta, we have to resort to Vedanta, in fact, to uh, en enlighten us as to who we are. That's the very interesting or very, uh, uh, very, let's say, uh, unusual thing. That I have to go to somebody else to find out who I am. Basically, I don't have a question. Who am I? That question never arises in me because I'm quite sure I know who I am. I can write a whole thesis about who I am. But well, sometimes to a thinking person that question may arise that who am I? Because in every situation my identity keeps on changing. Now I am a speaker, then I become a listener, now I am a father, then I am a son. I'm... And if you think like that, then you wonder. Every time you ask me, Swamiji, I mean, who are you? I then say, I am a father. Next time I am a son. Some other time I am speaker, some other time I am here, some other time I am happy, some other time I am unhappy. All the time my description of myself keeps on changing. And we never question that, we just go on as though there is nothing wrong about it. But if somebody a question can arise, how can it be? How can it be I keep on changing all the time? What is it what I am? Father I am, or son I am, or speaker I am, or hearer I am, or happy I am, or unhappy I am. How, how is it that my identity keeps on changing? Then most people have no time to think about it because there are too many other things to worry about and therefore, uh, you know, this generally escapes our attention. But it's possible that someday this kind of a thing can draw our attention and then we, there may be a need to know what is the real one? Like an actor which keeps on changing various roles and therefore the fellow performing roles must be different from the roles and I also seem to be going through so many roles, therefore I have to be different from the roles, that kind of a kind insight can come, in which case I can go to a teacher. Or somebody brings me here, you see how, how we say it, how the Puro Janma is there. I just read, heard a story, a very, very nice story of one of our own persons. You know that person, you may have heard this story also. 
This person lived in Argentina, a Spanish person. And uh, he had no idea about Vedanta or God or anything like that. And he had a girlfriend. And once his girlfriend said that I'm going to a lecture, do you want to come? He had no interest in going to a lecture. But because his friend was going, just to please her, I think, this fellow also went to a lecture. And he heard the lecture. Now, how can you explain this event? He heard the lecture and he was so touched by that, so impacted by that, that he says, I'll go to a course to in India. What is India? He doesn't know. People told him, you know, India, I mean, it's not easy to live there, all kinds of food, these kind of snakes, and I don't know, whatever, you know, <laughs> mosquitoes and uh, viruses and all kinds of, you know, people threatened. I mean, people really have warned him. He said, I don't care. We don't know even a word of English. What will you go do in India? I don't know. Can you imagine a person who does not know a word of English simply traveling and landing there in Coimbatore without a word of English? Imagine. And then I guess he learned English, he learned Sanskrit, he learned Vedanta, he learned all kinds of things. How do I explain this phenomenon? Unless there is something inside. This is a miracle, you know. And I'm sure each one of us may have such a miracle like that to talk about. But this shows that there is some history. This cannot be just a coincidence. There must be history. There must be something there. And like a seed, which is already sown in the ground, it just sprouts. All of a sudden you see the sprout. When the sprout comes, the seed must be there. So also an event like this shows that there is a history. <coughs> this is only in support of the argument that there has to be our previous history. That we cannot be just born you know, this cannot be a first birth, there has to be history. <clears throat> but then, coming back to our discussion, as I say, that this is how human being is an unhappy creature, a very unhappy creature. The human being is the most evolved in the creation, at the same time, the most unhappy or miserable creature also. Swamiji, is it not, why do you say human being is superior? Why, I think buffalo is better, buffalo has no stress at all. Is it not better than buffalo? No. Better than buffalo would be stone, he has no stress at all. In fact, buffalo would have some stress, some hunger and thirst. Stone doesn't have anything, but that's not the criterion, whether you have pain or not. The criterion is that, in fact, being aware of pain is a blessing. Because then you want to do something about it. If things are going on in the body and you don't know what's going on, all of a sudden recognize there's a huge cancer and then one month the fellow goes away, it's better that you become aware of it, you could have done something about it. And so this problem lies everywhere except human being is aware of this problem. That is called the, that is called the evolution. He is aware that there is a problem. <clears throat> and therefore he is aware of his inadequacy. And he, all the li life of the human being is nothing but and attempt to become free from the sense of inadequacy. So this is my perception of myself. Apart from being mother and daughter and, and, and whatever, I'm inadequate mother, inadequate daughter, inadequate friend, that inadequate is always the adjective which is attached to every role that I play. Whether I'm father or son, is not just simple father, inadequate father, inadequate son, inadequate brother, inadequate disciple, whatever. That sense of inadequacy is built in. This is what we call built-in unintelligence. We have not deliberately thought about it. And I don't think that I'm aware that I'm aware of my inadequacy, but it's built in there. And that is why I always behave as a person who is feeling inadequate and is always seeking ways of becoming free from the sense of inadequacy. That shows in every interaction that I do. In every interaction, when I meet you, when I talk to somebody, whenever I do something, in everything, always I'm, I'm on the lookout of how to grab something, how to get something out of the interaction so that I can somehow become free from my inadequacy. All of our transactions are, are always motivated by a desire to get something from every interaction. Get something emotionally, get something intellectually, get something physically, always get something. 
Thus, this sense of inadequacy makes me a seeker, makes me always a desirer, and all the various desires are there, and nothing but the expression of the sense of inadequacy. And my life is nothing but a process of constantly trying to become adequate. So this is our life. This is the unintelligence about myself, that I look upon myself as an inadequate being. <clears throat> it doesn't stop there. When I look upon myself as an inadequate being, and since I do not accept the inadequacy, that I want to be adequate, then I look out at the world and I see the world as a place from where I can get adequacy. Thus, superimposing inadequacy upon myself and superimposing adequacy upon the life. Look upon the world as a source of my adequacy. I feel insecure within myself, therefore automatically I look at the world, at least some part of the world, as a source of my security. I feel unhappy within, and therefore I look upon some people, some objects, some things as source of security. And that's how my perception of the world is what? My perception of the world is based on my perception of myself. That I have to, I have to reach the world. I have to go after the world as, in order to become adequate. And therefore, world appears to me to be a source of happiness, a source of adequacy, source of security. This is my perception of the world. But not the whole world, of course. Some people are source of happiness. Some other people are not. So, because some person is source of my happiness, therefore some other fellow is going to become source of unhappiness because there is a triangle. Like in the Indian movies, you know, so the triangle, and therefore whoever comes in the way, naturally there is going to be attachment here, so you know, aversion for something else. And therefore, this inadequate self always has what we call raga and dvesha. These raga dveshas or attachment aversions are both nothing but the product of a sense of inadequacy. Because if I feel that here is a person who, in whose presence I feel comfortable, in whose presence I feel good, then naturally, since I want to be comfortable, I want to be good, I seek out the presence or company of that person. If somebody else also wants to seek out that company, then that person becomes an obstacle to my association with this person. That person then becomes the object of aversion. That's a raga and dvesha, attachment and aversion. Whenever I look upon something as a source of happiness, I am bound to look upon something as, a, as an obstruction also. Make this, mark this out. Whenever I look upon something as a source of happiness, Surely, there will be something else which will cause unhappiness. Whenever I look at the ice cream, there is somebody who remind me, Swamiji, your blood report. <laughs> the, the spouse is there on the same table, and so the wife is there. This poor man, everybody is sitting on the dining table, and lots of sweets are prepared, and everybody is served, and this fellow also wants something, you know. She has not served him. And so he thinks that since Swamiji is there, I guess he can take some liberty. And Swamiji put some sweet in his eyes. Why don't you give him also? Give him one piece. Then she takes away. He says, no, Swamiji. He should not eat it. So attachment or liking for the sweet creates what? A dislike for the spouse because she comes in the way <laughs> of his enjoying it. It's going to be. Sometimes there are competitions, you know, between the husband and the father and mother for the child. Whose son are you? Whose child you are? He says, I am father's child. Then mother gets upset, mother's child. His child then becomes very clever, you know, in course of time. In the beginning, I guess it doesn't know and therefore then sees the reactions. Later on, he will be, become very clever and he manipulates both of them anyway. <laughs> until then. But anyway, since everything in the world is limited, therefore, and there are many claimants for limited number of things, there are always going to be somebody claiming what also I am claiming, and therefore, the possibility of dvesha or aversion is always there. That's why we quoted that verse from the Bhagavad Gita, where Lord Krishna says, Indriyasya 
Indriyasyarthe Ragadvesho Vyavasthitau That in our mind these likes and dislikes are only lodged in there meaning that we are born with the tendency of relating to the world with attachment or aversion because I am in the lookout for happiness I am in the lookout for adequacy and whatever I perceive as a source of happiness adequacy naturally I am going to be I am going to like it I am going to want it and if anything becomes an obstacle to my fulfilling that want, it is going to be an object of my dislike or object of aversion. Therefore, an inadequate person can only relate to the world with attachment and aversion in no other way. Because I am constantly aware of my inadequacy. I do not accept myself with inadequate. And therefore, a constant urge to become adequate. There were a constant attempt to become adequate. And that attempt will be in the form of reaching out for something which promises me the adequacy and avoiding something which promises me inadequacy. And therefore, I'm always reach out for something that is always favorableness, there's always partiality, there's always cruelty towards others. And therefore, my Vyavahara interaction is characterized by partiality and cruelty or raga and dvesha, attachment and aversion. <clears throat> so this is how my perception of world is. My perception of world is that world is the source of happiness or unhappiness. I look upon something as source of happiness, some other things as source of unhappiness. Some things, some people, some objects, some situations as the source of security, some others as source of insecurity some as source of comfort, some others as source of discomfort. <clears throat> this is how my perception of the world is. How about perception of God? Well, my perception of God, or my expectation of the God, is that God should do whatever I want Him to do. Actually, everybody wants God to do whatever they want. Therefore, if things go my way, I think that God is favorable to me. If things do not go my way, I conclude that God is unfavorable to me. And therefore, in my perception, God also is branded as favorable or unfavorable, kind or cruel. Swamiji, God, how can God be so cruel? How can he do this to me? Naturally. So when there is pain uh, in our life, then this is kind of, this is the kind of response that comes. And this is a feeling that God is unkind to me. God is cruel to me. So my perception of God, also understand, is again based on my perception of myself. So we are born with this perception of ourselves as an inadequate being. And that in turn determines my perception of the world. And world means everything outside of me and my perception of God. Even if, some, if somebody says, I don't believe in God, there is also a perception about God. If somebody says, there is God in heaven, there is also a perception. Somebody says, God is in everyone, also a perception. But this is, thus, Jiva, Jagat and Ishvara. The individual, the world and the creator. About all these three, we are born with this perception. Or we are born with tendencies to draw conclusions in this manner. When we are infant, we have no such understanding. As we grow, without being told, automatically we start drawing these conclusions. Because it is the nature of intellect always to draw conclusions, to judge. That is the nature of our intellect. We have a mind with which we feel and with intellect with which we know and judge. I have opinions, and thus it is the nature of intellect to have a judgment about everything, to have an opinion about everything. <clears throat> we may not express our opinions, but we have, we are bound to have an opinion about everybody and everything. It is that opinion about the person that determines how I'm going to interact with the person. Because if you watch me, when I receive the telephone, sometimes I'm so happy. How are you? 
Sometimes somebody else calls. Why did you call me? And so my response sometimes is anger, sometimes is with affection, sometimes is love, sometimes hatred, only because the person I already have an opinion. Sometimes, you know, and some person does not know that I have that opinion. They do not know why the Swami behaves like, why does he treat me like this? Because they do not know that I will have an opinion about that. People sometimes don't know. Swami, why do they talk like this to me? Why do they treat me like this? Simple. They already have an opinion about you. You do not know what their opinion is, but they think that you are a pain in the neck, suppose. <laughs> and therefore, moment to appear, there is going to be a response to avoid you, you know. Or you think that you are a bully, something like that. I don't know, X, Y, Z, whatever the opinions are. People do not change their opinions at all. They always retain them and always treat the people based on what their opinion. But that's the opinion. But everybody doesn't treat the person that way. And so, it is the nature of our intellect always to have opinion. First, I have opinion about myself because I'm conscious of myself. And subsequently, based on whatever I come in contact with, I'm going to have an opinion, which again is influenced by my opinion of myself. Because sometimes when I'm very happy, I got a promotion, I'm so happy. I come home with all kinds of gifts. People are surprised. This fellow brought gifts, you know, he never does it. But then today he's a different person, why? His perception has changed. I'm a successful person, I'm a happy person, always he become very generous and therefore he is very generous to people. So how my perception of others also changes according to changing my perception and how my behavior also changes depending upon how my perception changes. But what we are saying is that what is the basis of what we are is nothing but our perception of ourselves. <clears throat> that decides what I do and what I do not do. That decides how I perceive the world. That decides how I interact with the world. That decides how I perceive God and how I hold God in my own opinion and how I, what I do with God also. Because uh, sometimes we get so disillusioned with God. When consistently fails to fulfill your desire, then you become disillusioned and say, I don't believe in this God. This fellow, he threw away for 25 years is doing puja. And one day he was so angry, he took this God and he was out. God also was out. Why? Because what kind of God is this? I've been worshipping for 25 years. He doesn't do this for me. This is what, you know. And so, perception of God also is based on my perception of myself. <coughs> Therefore, intelligence has to start from myself. What I'm saying is that unintelligence, the basis of intelligence is in myself. And therefore, the intelligence has to start also from myself, meaning from the true perception of myself. So that is where we come to Vedanta and start with what Vedanta says. Vedanta says that you are limitless, meaning that Vedanta reveals about me, my nature which is quite contrary to what I take myself to be. Vedanta says, you are limitless. You are whole. You are complete, which is unbelievable, but this is what it is. And the teacher doesn't simply say you are limitless and stop there. Shows you how limitless, it shows a probability. Will you accept something or not? Can be either you accept something because it, you experience that, or you accept something because it is probable. So the Vedantic teacher shows a strong probability that limitlessness could very well be my nature. How does the teacher show that? I take myself to be a, an insecure person, an unhappy person, a limited person. Whereas the Vedanta teacher shows to me that no, that is a wrong conclusion about yourself. That's not what you are. Because if you are inadequate, then all the time you should always feel inadequacy. All the time you should feel inadequacy. But there are times when I do not. There are times when I do become free from sense of inadequacy. 
I'm not always sad, I'm not always unhappy. There are moments when I do become happy also. When I become happy, particularly when I become ecstatic, ecstatic then I, I lose myself, I forget myself. Sometimes, you know, some wonderful things happen to us now and then, and we have become so elated in that experience that momentarily we forget ourselves. So there are the experiences like that. What Swamiji calls a moment of happiness. Not just any moment of happiness, but this kind of moment. Where something unexpected, unexpectedly good happened. And you were so surprised, you were so pleasantly surprised that you just were ecstatic. In that moment of ecstasy, moment of extreme happiness, we completely forget ourselves, we lose ourselves, we forget ourselves. That's why you find people behaving in very awkward manner all of a sudden. They start hugging, they do something, which they normally don't do. Not there's anything wrong in hugging, but normally this fellow never does it. But it, somehow he became so happy, he started hugging. That shows that he is, he is not aware of himself. Meaning, that he is no more aware of himself as an individual that he is only aware of. <clears throat> what does that show? So, the Vedantic teacher only draws our attention to this one moment. This one moment of happiness, one moment of ecstasy, one moment of losing myself, one moment of feeling totally happy, says that this moment is a very important moment. This one moment reveals something about you. That moment reveals that, at least for the time being, for the moment, all the sense of inadequacy all the need, all the seeking has dropped completely and I become free from any need, free from any seeking at that moment. Usually, because I am an inadequate self, therefore, as I said, there is also a non-acceptance of my own self and that's why I always try to become different from what I am because I am not happy with what I am. This, as I said, human being is not happy, not happy with his own self. If un that was my nature, then I always would be unhappy, but there, there is this moment when that sense of unhappiness also drops off. You don't seem much impressed by this, but then this is very important. <laughs> Swami, so, one moment, what's the big deal about that? For the whole month I was miserable, for one moment I'm happy, so what's the big deal about it? Why is this one moment so important to you? Then all this continued experience of my sadness. But this one moment is important because at that moment everything has dropped off. All sadness has dropped off. All my inner craving has dropped off. All my inadequacy has dropped off. All, you know, everything has dropped off. The Vedantin says that whatever can drop off cannot be you. Whatever can drop cannot be your inherent nature because what is inherent can never go away, can never be dropped. And so sugar will always be sweet regardless of what kind of a container you put it in or what kind of a thing you put it in, what kind of color you give to the sugar, regardless of what shape you give, in what kind of crystal it comes, regardless of how it comes, it, in all forms, in all shapes, in all colors, in all containers, is always going to be sweet because sweetness is the inherent nature of sugar. Cat is a cat, always. Therefore, when it sees a mouse, it will jump. Whether it is a cat of the Queen of England, or cat of you and I, whatever it is, the cat is a cat. Whether it's a very precious cat, or, or a very simple, uh, you know, ordinary cat. Dog is a dog, meaning that that is called inherent, which never leaves you, which is what you always are. That is called inherent. And what is subject to going away, what is subject to being dropped off, cannot be your inherent nature. It is what we call incidental and not inherent. Thus we see 
that we are a combination or union of these two aspects. One is inherent, other is the incidental. We are a union of these two aspects, the inherent and the incidental. Like an actor who acts as a beggar is also a union of two aspects, incidental and inherent. That he is a wealthy person is the inherent nature of that person. That is a beggar is only incidental. And the inherent does not go away even at the incidental time, meaning that even when he is acting as a beggar and very effectively acting as a beggar, you know Swamiji's words, because he has studied hundreds of beggars, their styles he has studied, and therefore he has perfected his style of begging, and he has also perfected the art of bringing out real tears from his eyes and singing songs, and therefore what a real beggar cannot do, he does it much more effectively, even when he does it. At that time also, the inherent aspect that he is wealthy, that doesn't go away. The inherent does not in any way affect, the in incidental does not in any way affect the inherent. Even though this actor may act as a beggar for days and days, at least when he goes on, that the beggar's costume is dropped off, what can be dropped off cannot be inherent, it has to be incidental. And so, when Vedanta says that you are limitless, it is drawing our attention to what is inherent about us. When I say that I am a limited being, perhaps what is happening is that I am identifying myself with what is incidental. And when Vedanta says that you are limitless, Vedanta is drawing my attention to what is inherent. Like that bad actor, Suppose something happens to in his mind and he starts actually believing that he is a beggar. Then we the enlightened persons tell him, hey, you are not a beggar, you are a millionaire, hey, you are a billionaire. No, no, I am a beggar. And you say, you are a, then there is a contradictory statement, both statements are right. <clears throat> From his perception, he is a beggar because what is incidental, he takes as his nature, which is inherent. And when you tell him, hey, you are a billionaire, you are, in fact, negating what is incidental, that's called nathanity, and drawing his attention to what is inherent. This Vedanta teaches us that inherently we are adequate beings. We are limitless we are adequate, we are complete, this is the true perception of myself. And if this is what I come to know, and if this is what I live, then I would be an intelligent person in the true sense. Etat buddhva buddhiman syat. Lord Krishna says that knowing this, a person becomes intelligent in the true sense of the word. Or closer to I am to that nature, more intelligent my life becomes. So intelligent living we always relatively intelligent. The truly intelligent person, as I said, is a person who, who knows his true self and who lives a true self. But Swamiji, how can it be? If I am limitless, how can I take myself limited being? Why? How can it be? Like that millionaire or, or a multi-millionaire actor, who unfortunately equates himself to his costume and concludes that he is a beggar. There's a reason. The reason why this fellow thinks that he's a beggar, because he's wearing a costume of beggar. Perhaps this may not ever have happened to an actor, I do not know whether it has happened or not, but it can happen. Sometimes, because on the stage also they behave in some very funny manner, like this, this person who is uh, taking the role of a beggar and there is a script as to what he is supposed, how he is supposed to act. And beggar being what he is, and then there are people 
who meet him one after the other and then they treat him in a different way and then somebody uh, taunts him, somebody insults him, somebody does it, somebody maybe gives him a slap and goes away. And this fellow being a beggar, he's supposed to uh, take everything as it is, because he's a beggar. This is how he's supposed to act on the stage. And that's what is going on every day and very effectively he's doing it. Today what happened? We don't know. But today when one of them came on the, you know, one of the other actors on the stage and when he gave him a slap, this fellow gave me two punches. <laughs> and that other fellow was fly because he didn't expect. If he expected punches then he was ready, but he was not because every day this was happening and there was no punch and today real punches came, you know, and he was fell flat on the stage. And the curtain had to come down. And when the director of this play asked this fellow, hey, why did you do this? Why did you give him punch? So why did he slap me? So here, there is an identification. Meaning that, at this moment, it happened, something happened to this person, by which he forgot that he was an actor, and he actually became a beggar. He did not become the beggar, but then, in his own mind, he identified with the beggar. And that's how he acted as though he was a beggar. Meaning, such a thing can happen. That's called identification. Just as an actor identified with his costume, with his role, which is only incidental. But on account of identifying, because of that, his perception of himself completely changed and he acted according to his own perception. Something like that is there in our life also. That we are born with this habit of identifying with what is incidental. We are born with that habit. That we have a very beautiful costume. That is called the human costume. We have this very beautiful body and the mind and sense organs and the intellect and this very evolved equipment is given to us. But it is a costume. It is something incidental. Why incidental? Again, if you go back to our morning talk of how we must have passed through so many births, if you accept that. Swamiji, if I am a human being in this birth, next birth, will I be a human being? There's no guarantee. If during this lifetime, you act as a human being, you are born as a human being. If you act as something else, if you act as a demon, suppose, then you become a demon act as a dog, like a dog, in the sense that we can become anything, depending upon our karma. That's the theory. Which means that in the past, I may have gone through all kinds of births. Is not so? You must have heard the story of Bodhisattva, of Lord Buddha, 84 births of Bodhisattva. He passed through all kinds, he became an elephant, he became all kinds of things. That's the story that we have been told. Meaning that, you and I also must have had so many kinds of costumes in the past. It is conceivable that we were sometimes, because from the way the human beings behave, there is reason to believe that they must have gone through these births, you know. Sometimes they hiss like a snake, sting like a, sting like a scorpion, bark like a dog. You know, people do that, is it not so? And so I guess from that, there is reason to believe that they, may have gone, they must have known how to do these things. They must have had experience of this, meaning that they may have gone through their past lives in this manner. It's possible. <clears throat> and so, law of karma tells us that we get the kind of embodiment depending upon our karma. And who knows what kind of karma we may have performed and what kind of embodiments we may have gone through, but then, that is why some samskaras of all those things are there in us. And, you know, if this was the inherent upadhi or costume, I could not have been some other, in other, some other costume. If you don't like thinking that you are animals, at least you can think that you are gods. Meaning that if you, if you perform virtuous actions, you can go to heavens, then you become a god. Live there for a long time, Lord Krishna says. Prapya punyakratam lokan ushitva shashvati samaha So, the virtuous people actually go to heavens. Tedam bhuktva svarga lokam visalam They enjoy the vast 
world of heavens and all the divine pleasures, that is what you and I may have enjoyed many times. Meaning that we also became gods. In gods all there are categories. There are Gandharva, there are the singers, Kinnara, there are dancers. And then there are Karma Devatas, Devatas, there is a Indra who is a king, and there is Brahaspati who is a, who is a preceptor. There are also there are different categories. Maybe we would have become those things, who knows? The idea is that all those things are temporary, is it not so? Similarly, this also is a temporary costume that I'm wearing. How many costumes have I given up? And how many costumes have I adopted? Our Puranas abound in these stories. In Mahabharata and other places, you find these stories. When this king is just uh, lamenting about the death of his son or a prince, and then he is the and he tells Sage Narada, I want my son back. So I cannot bring your son back, but at least you can see your son. And the son comes down and says, what are, you, what, what are you talking about, father? Why are you crying? Do you know that in certain I was your father? Right now you are my father. Sometimes ago, I was your father. Then I was your son. What is this? You know, they are changing. Give up. What I'm saying is that these are all incidental things, meaning that this human upadhi that we have also is something that is subject to change. But the one who passes through all these different births is a constant entity. You understand? So there is within us something that is constant and something that is changing, something that is inherent, something that is incidental. And therefore, even this human upadhi also is incidental. <clears throat> like the costume, like the beggar's costume, that the actor is putting on. And if, for whatever reason, he identifies himself with that costume and takes upon his beggar, his perception has changed, his behavior changes, and similarly also, if I identify with my incidental costume, then my perception about myself is determined by that, and my behavior and life also is determined by that. So this is what is the case, in fact, that what is incidental in terms of the body, the mind, the sense complex, we take that to be inherent, we take that to be self, this is what we call a habitual identification. Why is it there? It is there. That's the habitual, that's the unintelligent, built-in unintelligence with which we are born. That there's nothing wrong in having this human upadhi. It's a beautiful thing to have. Imagine how nice would it have been when we knew that we are limitless. That even in this mortal body, I who is functioning through the mortal body is immortal. And in this intellect, which is in such a, has such a limited knowledge, I who is manifesting through that is of the nature of knowledge or consciousness. Suppose I had that knowledge, then this human upadhi would have been a great blessing. The whole life would have been great blessing. As a Swami said, life would have been a luxury. Everything would have been luxury. Right now I'm a needy person. Our everything would have been, would have been luxury. But unfortunately, that is not so. But that has to happen. Meaning, intelligent living should then be a process by which slowly I become free from this habitual identification and more and more identify with my true nature, with what is inherent in me, this would be the intelligent way of living. First, intelligent way of thinking, and secondly, intelligent way of acting. At the level of thinking, first transformation, a level of acting, the second transformation. So this first transformation has to happen to us, even at least intellectually. At least we are showing the probability that you could be different from what you take yourself to be. Probability. That I could be quite different from what I take myself to be. Because there are moments when these conclusions about myself, that I am limited being, there are moments when that conclusion drops off. When I feel free, that I am a bound person, that conclusion drops off. There are moments when I feel free. When there is no pressure at all, 
no internal pressure, no external pressure. There are moments when I do feel free. There are moments when I do feel happy. There are moments when I do feel happy with myself, I feel adequate. There are moments. That moment would not have been possible if inadequacy was inherent in me because what is inherent can never go away. So the one moment is important. And of course, every night we have the experience of this deep sleep. There's another experience that the Vedantins always like to point out. That in state of deep sleep also, I become free from all my complexes, free from all the pain and suffering. In the state of deep sleep, there is no suffering, there is no sorrow. Because at that time, I am free from all complexes about myself. And why am I free? Because at that time, by God's design, I become free from the habitual identification. So that is our vacation. Or that's the rejuvenation, you can say. Because for the whole waking day, Swamiji's life is very busy and very strenuous. So suffering from stresses and strains and conflicts and and pressures and stresses. When I go to sleep, there's a great relief. No stress and no strain, no complexes, no, no sorrow, no suffering, no conflict. There is a total freedom in a state of deep sleep state. That also is a probability. Again, we, Swami then, because we don't, exp- we don't, we are not aware of it, unfortunately. This deep sleep experience also is debated, of course. But at least Vedanta teaches us this. In deep sleep state, that we experience a total freedom. And it's probable that that must be so. In deep sleep state, we experience happiness. And the probability is there. Because deep sleep experience is always a desirable experience. If necessary, we take even sleeping pills in order to have that experience. Thank God the doctors don't mind. Otherwise, other other kind of pills they don't like, you know. Other experience of high air, etc. you want, they will not accept. But this they don't mind because this is something required by everybody. But how the experience of deep sleep is always a welcome experience. We never resist that. Nobody ever complains, Swamiji, I slept last night. <laughs> he may complain if he slept during watching a movie or something, that's a different thing, but otherwise nobody complains. And usually complaining people are our children, you know. Again, same Indian food. <laughs> Going to ashram again, doing this again, you know, all kinds of, but then going to school again, mom, again today, again school. But he never complains. Again going to sleep? I have to sleep today also? No complaints. Because that's a welcome experience. And therefore, everybody is happy to have the opportunity to experience deep sleep. And this probability, because there's no complaint. We look forward to that. And we are very reluctant also to come out of that experience. And that's why the morning alarm is the one that suffers the most because I was bang it. I don't want it to ring. And when it rings, I bang it. And there is a snooze, you know. So after five minutes, stop it. Then I ultimately snooze, I, I, I stop it altogether and then sleep for one more hour. <clears throat> most of us must have gone through these kind of experiences. Particularly when there is Sunday, you know. But why do you set alarm on Sunday? Because I was Swamiji, I must perform my morning prayers, I must do that, my morning medi- yoga asana, then pranayama and prayers, and so I must wake up at 5 o'clock. On Sunday, forget it, we'll do it tomorrow. No yoga asana today, no pranayama, nothing, no prayers, nothing. Take liberty. Nobody takes liberty of doing pranayama two times, you know. Or <laughs> yoga, that liberty nobody takes. <laughs> they try to prime for two hours, that nobody does. But then sleep one more hour, that liberty everybody takes. That just shows the probability that it is a very pleasing experience. Yeah, we'll have the question and the session. Just kindly deserve a question. Write down, please. <clears throat> 
also as Panchadashi points out that this fellow is so careful in preparing for sleep he must have the right kind of bed right kind of what do you call it the comforter somebody has one pillow two pillows pillow three I don't know different people are different kinds of things you know but that's exactly what they want and for sleep no compromise I must have what I want so that I can enjoy my sleep meaning that the preparation of sleep also shows that I'm looking forward to a very pleasant experience also when you wake up from the sleep you wake up always refreshed it is a refreshing experience if you had good sleep Swami I never feel refreshed maybe I don't have experience sometimes but then if you had good sleep you experience refreshed you feel you have a sense of well-being until of course the the samsara has you know samsara uh, again takes over my head until then that's why Ramana Maharshi said that meditate upon before you wake up right away those moments are there Panchadashi also points out this that there is a transition period so deep sleep the full waking time there is some transition period it may not be a very long period but utilize that period Ramana Maharshi used to say that meditate at that time that you are feeling relaxed you are refreshed still the samsara has not overtaken me still the worries and anxieties of the day have not overtaken me at that time take that moment and meditate upon yourself and remind yourself that this is your nature this is what you are that fellow who is running around and all the kind of stress that is not your true nature this is your true nature meaning that in deep sleep also we are very close to our true nature and that's what also Vedanta teaches that so in short in the deep sleep state also all the complexes are dropped off that's for sure that's for sure that there's, self, there's no self-consciousness in deep sleep that is for sure if I was self-conscious I would not sleep the way I am sleeping I would not snore it's definitely not who will want to snore thank God that the person doesn't know that is why if he knew his spouse knows his or her whatever they say you know, but then uh, if I had if I knew if I was aware I would, you know but the way I behave in deep sleep state the way I sleep the way my hands and legs are in that position shows that I do not I am not aware of myself in the waking state you never find me like that you find me always you know in, in a particular in particular when you want to take my picture you always see my face smiling and everything and in deep sleep state my angavastra is this way and this way and that way and I'm not concerned why? because I'm not aware of no I'm not identified with the body the self-consciousness that I am so and so is not there so all of these are the signs which show a strong probability not a proof but a strong probability the proof of course is given by Upanishads and we look upon that as Pramana but still if you want to logically only analyze then also all of these show a strong probability that in deep sleep state I am free from all my complexes free from a sense of inadequacy meaning that this complex is inadequacy everything drops off in deep sleep what drops off cannot be inherent to me it must be incidental simple rule that the crystal is transparent and pure and then it may appear to be orange and appear to be some other color but the color is subject to coming and going what changes cannot be inherent what does not change alone is inherent and therefore even when this crystal appears to be orange it is not it does not become orange only appears orange oranginess is incidental to crystal and at that time also its inherent transparency and colorlessness has not gone away and similarly also we display many characteristics which are all changing in, in through all this changing changing states all the various changing uh, opinions about myself all these changing roles there is a connecting link there is something that does not change and 
like crystal, which appears to have different colors, but it remains colorless. That colorless crystal is the very locus of the colors being superimposed upon that, and so also the true nature of myself is the very locus upon which these various complexes are superimposed. And thus, what Vedanta says, that you are free, that you are limitless. There is a strong probability from our experiences that what Vedanta says is plausible, is probable. And maybe what I take myself to be is not right. This is the first stage. Call it intellectual knowledge. So I don't experience it, don't worry. Intellectual knowledge is that which shows probability. Then, th- this is, if we make this as a basis, the thing is, what is intelligent living? Making that true nature of myself as a basis and slowly and slowly giving up my notions and my priorities and my values and my perceptions which are based on my wrong perception. So that will be the, the next step. Once this first step is clear, the next step will follow. We'll continue with that. <clears throat> Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachyade Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyade Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om